Hello everyone, this is Anuradha Sharma and you are watching my channel Eyes with Anuradha. Part 1 you will hear a female and a male student talking to a female tutor about a self-evaluation form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Now, Mark and Anna. I have to say that I thoroughly enjoyed your joint presentation on the application of robotics in a non-industrial setting to the group on the 2nd of December and it is clear that you have both devoted quite a lot of time and effort to it. Have you had a chance to fill in the self-evaluation form for the session? Yeah, we have. So, Mark, what do you think overall? Well, generally I felt the presentation worked very well. In fact, we seemed to hold the attention of the others throughout, and the pace of delivery was fairly even, as were the range of activities we organised. I agree with Mark. But I'm not sure we were comprehensive or academic enough. No comment, really, except that I don't think there was any question of it not being thorough. I think we were a bit too chatty and too jokey at times, rather than formal. OK, what do you think were the best areas? And which do you think can be improved on? Well, everything could have been improved on. I felt very good about the handouts. We'd spent a lot of time putting them together. They had a very professional appearance as we bound them into a booklet. To me, the handouts were the best part, as we had a very extensive bibliography and the booklet seemed to go down well. The booklet you did for the handouts certainly showed you had done a lot of work. But I think that you put too much material into it and people got distracted by it. Perhaps you could have cut the handouts by about a third. I see. When I come to think about it, maybe you're right. OK. But there were times in the middle of the presentation where things did go a bit astray. I think that was my fault when I got the PowerPoint slides out of sequence and I had difficulty getting back on track. Mm. I also think we rated our technical ability too highly, especially when operating under pressure. I had never done a presentation with technical equipment before, so it was a steep learning curve for me in particular. Yes, I think you could have done with a bit more practice with the equipment beforehand. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. What about the next item on the feedback form, the aims and objectives? I think they were very focused and we followed them through well, I think. We wanted to show how Europe was lagging behind other areas of the world. Yeah, I think they were clearly set out. Yes, agreed. No comment there. The diagrams and charts were appropriate. Yes, I have put that too. They did work well in helping to illustrate and break up the presentation by cutting down on the number of words and text on the screen. What about delivery? Well, I think our performance was average. It was difficult to coordinate speaking and presenting the material at the same time. I was quite self-conscious of what I was doing, it was down to a lack of experience. Unfortunately, both of you had the habit of standing in front of the projector, so you kept blocking the image on the screen. To me, this is the area that requires the most improvement. The section on the predictions of the commercial application in the future, I think, appeared a bit haphazard. Uh, to me, it was a weak point of the presentation. And I think that some of the slides could have had fewer words. And we could have done some fancy graphics with the words. If you had to give yourselves a mark overall, 
How much would you give out of ten? Six, maybe. I'd be happy with that, though bits were probably nearer a seven, so I'd say a six. Anna, what do you think? I think for me it's perhaps a seven. Okay. Did you find the task and the evaluation useful? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour of a newly renovated health club. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Thank you all for coming to see the new renovations to the Hartford Health Club. I know you'll be as pleased as I am to see the wonderful results of our months of hard work to improve the club and bring you the best facilities ever. We'll begin in here with the swimming pool. You'll notice the new colour of the adult pool, a lovely cool green. Now walk over here and look at the children's pool. It's the same green, but as you see, with brightly coloured sea creatures painted everywhere. Both of the pools needed painting, not only for maintenance, but I think the new colour greatly improves the atmosphere of this part of the club. Next, let's take a look at the locker rooms. Don't worry, there's no one using them just now. Doesn't it feel roomy in here? We've expanded both the men's and women's locker rooms, so now they'll be much more comfortable to use. There are bigger lockers, a good deal more room in the dressing area, and more places to store extra towels and equipment. Be careful as you walk through here; the floor's just been polished and may be a bit slippery. Let's go up to the exercise room next. Here, you'll notice a new floor. Walk on it. Doesn't that feel comfortable? It's a special material, softer than the old floor, an ideal surface for jogging and exercising. They had to move all the exercise equipment out while they were working on the floor, but don't worry, it will be brought back in before the end of today. Let's step outside now and look at the tennis courts. We haven't done a great deal here except to the equipment. We replaced all the nets and the ball throwing machine. Otherwise, everything is the same as it was before. Let's walk down this hallway, and here we are at the club store in its new location. We thought here by the entrance was a better place for it than where it used to be by the swimming pool, but it still has all the same items for sale: sports equipment and clothes in the club colours. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. We're excited about the upcoming activities and events to take place in our newly renovated club. Now that the pools are ready for use again, swimming lessons will begin tomorrow for both adults and children. If you haven't signed up yet, you can stop by the office before you leave today and put your name on the list. If you're a tennis player, you'll be interested to hear about the tennis competition coming up on Wednesday. 
Players from different clubs all over the region will be participating. If you'd like to watch the event, tickets are available in the office. Also, I want to be sure you all know you're invited to our club party coming up next weekend. We're celebrating the completion of the renovation work and we have a lot to celebrate. The entire renovation project was finished in just nine months. That's three months less than the 12 months we'd originally planned on. We're proud of that and proud that we came in under budget too. Because we've had such good results with this project, we're already planning the next one. We already have two indoor pools, and next year we plan to install an outdoor pool right next to the tennis courts. Details of these plans will be made available to all club members soon. All right, I think we've covered just about everything. Are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a lecture on language learning. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. This is the first in our series of lectures on language learning. The topic I'd like to deal with today is what makes a successful language learner? There's been a lot of research into what makes some people learn a language faster than others. In this lecture, I'll summarize the main findings of the research into the subject. There are many factors that influence how quickly one learns a foreign language, of which exposure to the target language seems to be one of the most important factors to consider. It's this factor which determines the speed of learning a language, especially among those people who learn a foreign language outside the classroom. There are more people who did not learn a second language or a third language in the classroom, and I think that understanding how learners successfully learn languages without the help of a teacher can provide us with the key to how to become a successful language learner. Let's look, then, at the characteristics of a successful language learner. Motivation seems to be one of the key factors. Research into motivation has identified two main types, instrumental motivation and integrative motivation. Instrumental motivation is the kind of motivation that encourages people to learn a language for practical reasons, such as getting a job or passing an examination. Learners with this kind of motivation intend to use the target language as a tool or instrument to help them achieve a goal. Integrative motivation is what encourages learners to learn a language in order to communicate and socialize with others who speak the language. The primary aim for learners with integrative motivation is to use the language to integrate and identify with the community that uses the language. Immigrants, or people who are married to speakers of another language, are motivated in this way. Although most people have mixed motivation, research into language learning and acquisition suggests that integrative motivation produces much better results 
and is an important characteristic of successful language learners. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Personality is another important factor in language learning. One does not need to be an extrovert to learn a foreign language, but willingness to experiment and take risks is essential. Introverted or anxious learners who are afraid of making mistakes find it harder to learn a language. Good language learners will try to experiment with different ways of learning vocabulary or grammar until they find the way that suits them best. Language is a complex system. Successful language learners often design complex learning systems to master a language. They think about how they learn and organize their learning accordingly. They develop their own learning style and use a range of learning skills such as efficient revision techniques, systems for learning and organizing vocabulary, the ability to monitor their own speech and the ability to plan their learning. Finally, age is another major factor to be borne in mind. Children seem to be in the best position to learn a foreign language rapidly and with the best results. Older learners can also be very successful and become proficient at using a language. Adult learners who make decisions about their learning and are independent of the teacher, who are analytical and aware of how they learn and who take responsibility for their learning, stand a very good chance of learning a foreign language successfully. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about psychological testing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello, my name is Alexandra Blaby, and today I'll be talking about one of the ways in which personality can be assessed, psychometric testing. Psychometric literally means measuring the mind, and there are many carefully constructed tests which attempt to carry out this process. Probably the most common use for these tests is to help people find out the careers that most suit their personality. Many employers ask new job applicants to take a psychometric or personality test as part of their selection procedure. One of the features of this type of test is that there are no right or wrong answers to the questions. For this reason, it would be more accurate to call them assessments rather than tests. 
there are four main types of personality tests currently in use. These are questionnaires, ratings tests, projective tests, and objective tests. Let's start by considering questionnaires, as these are by far the most common method. Here, subjects are asked between 50 and 100 questions about themselves. A typical question might be, do you enjoy spending time alone? There are two advantages to questionnaires. Firstly, they are easy to administer. And secondly, the questions are answered by the person who knows the subject best, themselves. By contrast, a ratings test is done by someone who knows the subject well rather than the subjects themselves. A rater might be asked, for example, to agree or disagree with a statement about the subject. A typical statement might be, he laughs a lot. The effectiveness of ratings tests depends on how well the rater knows the subject. Projective tests ask the subject to make sense of information which is unclear in some way. In the famous ink blot test, for example, subjects have to say what a patch of ink on a piece of paper looks like to them. Finally, objective tests. In these tests, the subject has to engage in a physical activity. How they do it will tell the tester something about their personality. For example, the subject might be asked to blow up a balloon until it bursts. From observing how the subject does this, the tester will be able to say how timid or brave he or she is. Perhaps at this stage, we should clarify what exactly we learn about people from psychometric tests. The overall purpose of the tests is to identify personality leanings or inclinations rather than fixed qualities or, as some people fear, character weaknesses. This explains why tests often include several similar questions. How consistently the subject answers these will enable the tester to reach an accurate assessment. Incidentally, the assessment procedure may be carried out by a psychologist or another trained individual, but is most frequently done automatically by a computer. The effectiveness of any method which asks questions, of course, is heavily dependent on the individual's willingness to answer a set of standard questions. One of the most well-respected psychometric tests is the Myers-Briggs test, which asks subjects about their preferences in four main areas. Firstly, the test asks people where they direct their energy, to the outer world of activity or the inner world of thoughts and emotions. Secondly, people are asked how they prefer to process information, in the form of known facts or in the form of possibilities. The third area is decision-making. Do people make decisions on the basis of logic or of personal values? Lastly, Myers-Briggs tests ask people how they prefer to organize their lives in a structured or a flexible way. Although there are those who disapprove of personality testing, there is no doubt that it is here to stay. Human beings have always been curious to find out about themselves and others. Psychometric testing gives them an objective, scientific means of doing this. Well, that's all for today. Tomorrow, I'll be examining ways of measuring intelligence. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.